Welcome to Newsnight from Crewe. In 48 hours, could the voters here mark the beginning of the end of Labour in power? Good evening. As you might expect, two days before polling, all parties are saying they can win what may turn out to be the most dramatic by-election for years. If the polls are anywhere near right, the Conservatives are poised to take their first by-election seat from Labour in a quarter of a century. The people of Crewe and Nantwich, therefore, potentially hold Gordon Brown's future in their hands. This town has returned a Labour MP for the past 60 years. David Grossman assesses whether a political earthquake is in the offing. The battle for this railway constituency has been one of the dirtiest in recent political history. I'll have all the gory details. Also tonight, MPs are voting right now on whether to cut the time limit for abortions. The law hasn't been changed for 18 years. We'll have the latest from Westminster. In the heart of the Crewe and Nantwich constituency, this really ought to be safe Labour territory in the Marble Hall of the Crewe Hall Hotel, where once they held high-ranking German prisoners of war, and tonight we've incarcerated an audience of local voters and a smattering of high-ranking and not-so-high-ranking politicians. Now, some of the audience are die-hard supporters, some have decided to switch, to switch, and many are still open to persuasion. So what's at stake for the parties here? Uh, Michael Gove, as far as you're concerned, if you don't win this, you're in big trouble, aren't you? Well, I don't think we're in trouble, but obviously we're fighting hard to try and win. But as you pointed out earlier, Jeremy, this seat's been Labour for 60 sure. years. I think even in the, in the 80s, when Margaret Thatcher was riding high, this seat was never Conservative. And what we want to do is to use the campaign, sure. in but effect, to give the voters you have a to chance to send a message to you Gordon Brown. You know you have to win this. Well, it's a, it's a choice for the voters. Ultimately, people in Crewe and Nantwich well, have to decide what the message they want to send. Is. Absolutely. Well, but, but if they right. choose to vote for the Labour candidate, then what they're doing is letting Gordon Brown off the hook. Right, yes. And you need to be let off the hook, don't you? Well, it's about choosing the best person to best represent the people of Crewe and Nantwich. That's what the Labour campaign and an excellent candidate in Tamsin Dunwoody has been about. Well, we'll come to whether she's an excellent candidate in a moment or two, but if you lose this election... Gordon Brown really has got the skids under him, hasn't he? I don't accept that for a moment. Oh. It's a by-election, huge concentration in by-election, both for national journalists like yourself, but actually for the people of Crewe and Nantwich. They have a choice to make. They have a choice between an excellent candidate, a Labour candidate, very much the daughter of her mother, a much-loved Member of Parliament, Gwyneth Dunwoody, who sadly died, and I believe that Tamsin Dunwoody is the right person to fight for the people of Crewe and Nantwich. Uh, and uh, Vince Cable, well, you're not going to win it, obviously. Uh, I wouldn't say not, obviously. No, we uh, have, we're fighting not, to win... We're, we're maintaining this fiction that you could possibly we win. We are fighting to win the seat. What is very clear is that there's a lot of support draining away from the Labour Party, an enormous amount. People haven't mm. yet fully made their mind up how to use the vote, and I think there are a lot of people here who do not want to vote Conservative and find us an attractive alternative. We have an excellent candidate, Elizabeth Shenton, mm. and I think a lot of people are migrating to her and we have a lot of momentum. All right, well, we'll come to the excellent or otherwise of the candidates in a moment or two, but we should look at something in context, I think, first of all, because you must pity the bin men of Crewe and Nantwich. In the last few weeks, a small forest of leaflets, flyers and election addresses have jammed letterboxes of homes all round here. Almost every senior politician has paid a visit, that is, except the Prime Minister, who, unlike in the last by-election, has somehow managed to miss the very regular train service to this old railway town. But David Grossman managed to make it up here, and here's his assessment of the campaign. A by-election is always an unreal place from which to judge national politics. The prize is so big, the battleground so small, and the campaign so brief that things always end up feeling a bit weird. But this one, well, this one has become positively bizarre. If Labour lost by-elections in the past, they tend to present them as a bit of local difficulty, meaningless protest. But this time, if Labour doesn't hold on to Crewe and Nantwich, there are plenty of people who will say it has far more significance, that it could in fact be terminal for Gordon Brown's administration. Given that the stakes are so high, Labour's tactics have been somewhat extraordinary, focusing on class and a shoe repair shop. 
or more exactly a chain of shoe repair shops owned by the family of the Conservative candidate Edward Timpson. He himself is a barrister, but Labour leaflets betray him as a Tory boy toff, complete with superimposed top hat. They accuse him of owning a big mansion house which has, quote, exotic South American llamas roaming the farmland behind. The Labour candidate is Tamsin Dunwoody. This is all designed to back up her campaign slogan, One of Us. The Labour Party even dispatched top-hatted campaign volunteers to stalk David Cameron when he visited. Here you can see a Conservative volunteer with a placard trying to block one of them out of the shot. This isn't exactly grown-up politics. I think it's backward-looking, it's out-of-date, it's divisive. Uh, trying to fight a class warfare thing, I think that's completely out-of-date. I don't think people respond to that anymore, so I hope it will backfire. It's aimed at you. I mean, do you take this personally? No, look, I mean, if you're in politics, you've got to be prepared for some bricks to be thrown at you, and, and I'm quite happy for that. But I think it's, it's just bad for our politics. I can't believe Tony Blair ever would have done this. I mean, he believed in one nation and opportunity and aspiration, and I think this lot are just going back to the past. I'd like to tell you the story of the Honourable Algernon, who was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Labour has campaigned on class before, but generally it's a sign of desperation. This 1976 party election broadcast wasn't exactly a success. Labour lost the next general election to Margaret Thatcher. Tony Blair's view was that only a Labour party that appealed to everyone could ever hope to win enough support to govern. My friends, the class war is over, but the struggle for true equality has only just begun. Simon Hughes has experience of winning by-elections for the Liberal Democrats. He believes the Labour strategy has been hopelessly flawed. They knew what the issues were going to be. There was going to be unpopularity of the government, unpopularity of the Prime Minister. So what, you, what should you do? You would try and distance your candidate from the government and the Prime Minister. But actually, all they've done is try to be offensive about other people. So instead of playing to the strength of their candidate, whatever strength she has, they've just tried to be rude about some of the opposition. I don't think people here like it. There are all sorts of accusations of dirty tricks in this campaign. These Conservative posters are being replaced, having been defaced by hand or hands unknown. Allegations also that volunteers have been ringing up voters at four in the morning, pretending to be from the other side. The Conservative campaign, meanwhile, has tried to remind people of the Labour government's problems. We can't get away from the fact that time and time again, when people are asked what their issue is, Gordon Brown's name is mentioned. And that's why this is a golden opportunity for the people of Crewe and Nantwich to vent their frustration, their anger towards him by sending Gordon Brown a message on Thursday. The Labour campaign focusing on hereditary privilege is even more strange when you consider the pedigree of the Labour candidate. She comes from a very political family. Here she is, age seven, with her Labour MP parents. Her mother, Gwyneth Dunwoody, held the crew and Nantwich seat from 1983 up until her death last month. Your mum was an MP, your dad was an MP, your grandmother was a Labour peer and your grandfather was... General Secretary of the Labour Party. Have I missed anyone out? Uh, the two great grandmothers who were suffragettes, but other than that, you're nearly right. <laughs> but that, that's quite a political dynasty. I mean, if you talk about political privilege, you're as dynastic as it gets, you're as aristocracy as it gets. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'm aristocracy, but I'm most certainly stroppy and I'm most certainly schooled in absolute rock solid Labour Party politics, and I am, you know, really a strong socialist. The Liberal Democrats used to be experts in attracting tactical voting, but at this election, some believe that they themselves are in danger of being squeezed out of the contest. And talking to people on the doorstep and meeting people on the street, the squeeze is not there. The race is now between us and the Conservatives, very much so. I mean, you know this has been a traditional Labour area, and the Labour vote has fallen away totally now. And the Conservatives, it's not a Conservative area. People don't want to go that, that far to vote Conservative. They know by voting Liberal Democrat that they can send a message to the government that they've had enough. Many of the voters here will be very glad when the political circus moves out of their lives, but for the parties, Crewe and Nantwich could have longer-lasting significance. Quite simply, Gordon Brown and David Cameron both need to win.
Well, as we near the end of this tough campaign, we're also joined by some of the candidates standing on Thursday. You might notice one notable absentee. Edward Timpson, the Conservative candidate, says he has a clashing engagement, so uh, made his comment for this evening in our film there. Now, here's a full list of the candidates standing on Thursday. All of their names can be found on the BBC website. Uh, Tamsin Dunwoody, um, do you want to apologise for this tough nonsense? No. You see, it's a very odd thing, isn't it? You'd expect a toff would be listed in something like Burke's Peerage. Um, he's not, of course, and nor is he listed in Burke's Landed Gentry, and, and you are. <laughs> That's news to me, but anyway... Yeah, it's in tomorrow's papers. <laughs> well, I'll read it in the papers tomorrow. So this, on... this toff thing is just rubbish. No, it's a visual imagery which has had a very clear it's impact. It's not just visual imagery, it's words too. I've seen it in your election literature. Which has had a very clear impact to make sure that the voters of Crewe know exactly what their choice is. So his sin of being a public school barrister, one also that was committed, of course, by your leader, Tony Blair, uh, is something that marks him down in the eyes of voters. No, it makes a very clear distinction between what is most applicable for the voters of Crewe and Nantwich and to whom they can most closely relate who can actually defend them in much the same way as they've had a very strong voice in Parliament for the last 34 years. Do you want to apologise for this nonsense? No, I don't. This happens in all by-elections, Jeremy. No, You've been doesn't. covering by-elections for years. You know full well <laughs> this kind of thing always takes place. What, stupid things are said which are untrue? This is about, as Tamsin made clear, about demonstrating who has the best ability to represent the people of Crewe and Nantwich. Someone who knows this area, who spent months and months in this area, mm -hmm. someone who has campaigned hard for the uh, things that matter to people in Crewe yes, and Nantwich. unfortunately, your home is, what, 180 miles away, isn't it? It certainly is, but I have, a hun I have 34 years very close links with this constituency. And you're castigating and this teams... man for living 18 miles outside the constituency, you live uh, 30 miles outside the constituency, you live 180 miles outside the There's constituency. A slight difference between his living in, in a very wealthy village, uh, 18, 19 miles outside the this constituency, is... and my having 34 this is years piffle, of links. isn't it? No, <laughs> it's about demonstrating who is best placed to... <laughs> deal with the concerns, the anxieties of the people of Crewe and Nantwich. Tamsin Dunwoody, who's campaigned for the regeneration of the centre of Crewe, campaigned to preserve the historic railway station, who's campaigned against antisocial behaviour. Someone who understands the needs and concerns of the people of this constituency. There is a real point in this, isn't there? And is the people remember exactly what a Tory government was like? I'm sorry, that's a complete non sequitur, Jeremy. We just had a very um, <laughs> revealing exchange from Tamsin and Jeff. They're clearly both uncomfortable with a campaign that has played the man, not the ball. As far as I'm concerned, if you were choosing a candidate, of course you want a fighter, and that's what Edward Timpson has been. No, Whether it's been campaigning on post office closures or campaigning um, in order to support the local hospital late in the hospital, where all his three children were born, Edward's been in the vanguard of that campaign. Now, you make a reference to the last Tory government. People like, uh, like Jeff and Tamsin might want to conduct a campaign that is out of the history books, but I think most people in the 21st century are more concerned about a candidate's see, fighting qualities than people, about fighting this sort of absurd campaign. People remember what happened under the last Conservative government. They remember, for example, in a mm. railway town, you're privatising of the railways. Yes. Do you want to apologise for that? Well, as far as I'm concerned, the privatisation of the railways was a mistake that we made. The way in which we did it was oh, one which was, as far as I'm concerned... What other mistakes have you got planned for is if you get back into government? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what other mistakes have you got planned if you go back into government? Well, Je you I was going to say, Jeremy, you could, you, I, I see the problem with this line of questioning, which, as far as I'm concerned, reflects the <laughs> bankruptcy of the, of the Labour campaign, because there is nothing positive in the Labour no. campaign. Um, we know that both Tamsin and Jeff have fought a campaign which has been based primarily, for example, on raising immigration as an issue, even though it's Labour that's been presiding over the levels of immigration that may have caused public concern. Well, what you choose to do, it hasn't Jeremy, been primarily, is to... Is to that what is you choose one to of do, the issues which we're going to talk about a little later in the programme. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll look forward to that. I'm but saying the point she's I'm, raising echoes of an old Tory party. You've just apologised for an old Tory party policy. Well, I'm, I'm just asking you uh -huh. what other mistakes you might have in mind. Well, I, I was going to say, as far as I'm concerned, it's important that we concentrate on the future. Mm. Instead of asking about the mistakes that you know, may have been made in the past, I think most people are more concerned about the mistakes that have been made by the current Prime Minister. More people well, in this campaign, are I think, also past I've raised, when well. I've been right. on the doorstep, the decisions that Gordon Brown has made, for example, over the ten pence yeah. tax rate. Yeah, all right, let's uh, just turn, turn to the Lib Dems, uh, and then you're all free to have a go. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth Shenton, you were, you were parachuted in here uh, when there was already... Uh, prospective uh, candidate, wasn't it? What have you got that he didn't have? 
First of all, Jeremy, I wasn't parachuted in. I was selected by the local party. The Liberal Democrats have a from policy a that when list of two and you, the Liberal Democrats have from, a, the Liberal Democrats have a policy of when a by-election is called, if there's a parliamentary candidate in place, then it's, it's all open and anyone can apply. So what was wrong with this bloke? A parliamentary candidate can actually apply for a seat in, an, in another area if there was a by-election. So I went through the selection procedure, which was a fair democratic selection so procedure. So why wasn't he on the shortlist? And, and the local party selected me as their candidate. Him? What was wrong with him? I think it's what's right with me is what the people of Kuru and Nantwich are looking well, right, for. What's which right is why with you that was wrong with him? <laughs> because they see me as being someone who can relate to so, local people well, because of my background of which all my so life. You relate to local people? Yes, I do. And yet. he didn't. That's the problem, is it? There is, there is no problem in the okay. um, selection but, well, of the Vince, candidates. Well, Vince Cable, you preside over this, uh, well, your party presides over this. Um, can you help us? Well, she's got a fantastic candidate with a really remarkable CV. I mean, she's somebody who's negotiated for many years uh, on behalf of bank workers, uh, people predominantly on low pay, a very good, effective trade union negotiator. She won a prize from the BBC as a result of her ability to mobilise finance for her local community, as where she's a councillor, actually, seven miles down the road. So, you know, this is somebody with a very effective Real, uh, history of action in well, local government and in the trade union. Then. Let me just ask some members of our audience, and I'm not going to claim you're a representative of the constituency as a whole, but they are certainly, there are Tories, there are Labour, there are Lib Dem, there are undecided, there are switches. I mean, has it been a good campaign? What about you, sir, right at the back? Go on. No, it's been a, a diabolical campaign. Diabolical uh, campaign? Yes. When I, was in, when, when I was in business, one of the rules, the first rules of sales was that you don't knock the competition. You present your own case yep. and your own argument and, and let people decide from that. Uh, but also, from my point of view, it's been a, an appalling campaign because not one of the parties has spent any time at all on the issues affecting uh, older people. We have been uh, blanked out. Will this appalling campaign stop you voting? Uh, it won't stop me voting. It's making hmm. me very difficult to decide who to vote for. Well, that's presumably one of the things that some of the parties wanted to encourage. It may well be, yes, yes, but I always vote, even if I go and spoil my paper. Uh, anybody else? You, sir, what do you think about this um, campaign? I thought this was a by-election, not a vicar's tea party. I mean, let's, let's get real about this. It's a by-election. I mean, with those of us with long Labour memories, we remember Smethwick, don't we? What happened there? We remember the demon eyes. I mean, why have all of a sudden the Tories throwing their hands up in horror and saying, oh, you're picking on this. What's going on here? This is politics. It's a by-election. And I think... <laughs> Tamsin's campaign has been well fought. Her issues have been brought out. We know who the candidate is. We know what she <coughs> believes in. So this nonsense that I'm hearing from one or two people, and I'm thinking to myself, what are they talking but about? But it's not one or two oh. people. But, no, hang, on. hang on, we're well, in from well, the audience. Well, we're well, 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 here from I'm, voter, well, voter, 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 party. Voters, for, voters of the constituency. Yes, sir, you. I do think that um, young people will be very disillusioned with how they've seen our politicians behave. And, I, uh, you know, and um, I think it's a shame that um, these candidates really didn't step up to the plate and really understand that this is a town which still is very neighbourly, a town with a great history, a town that has 3,500 jobs at Bentley, uh, a very good hospital. I mean, it has three surgeries that is world-class, I mean, an industrial estate just five minutes away from here that would be the pride of any place in England. It's, it's a shame that the politicians didn't, you know, go on them things to make... Uh, now, OK. The, the youth, I do but, feel sorry for the youth. Thank a, you. A lot of the um, reporting and the polling that's been done here suggests that the big issue is an issue about the cost of living and the ten pence tax rate and... and all the associated material with that. You're nodding your head here in the front row. Uh, do you, is that how it, is that for you being the, the big issue in the campaign Those so far? Those are two of the points. I mean, I've been voting Labour. You know, I would never vote anybody else. However, this time, I don't know whether I can. Not for locally, but because of the national government and what they've done. And the 10p tax, I've defended Gordon Brown, and I think I must be the last person in the country left who will try to defend Gordon. Don't worry, I still do. Oh, well done. <laughs> but as much as with all the stuff that the Labour Party have done mm -hmm. with the minimum wage and with tax credits and, and pension credits for pensioners and all the stuff that they've brought in that a lot of the Tories opposed, 
You still cannot defend <clears throat> this 10p tax. Basically, he's alienated his core well, vote. Well, hang on a second. I mean, this is a bit of Tamsin Dunwoody propaganda here. There's still people who... You told Tam... This is her, your campaign, Tamsin Dunwoody. You told Tamsin your concerns. She put them directly to the Chancellor. She stood up for you. This week, the government took action. So, personally, you reversed the 10p tax change. Congratulations. How did you do it? <laughs> the Prime Minister obviously admitted that a mistake had been made yeah. and he was going to but reverse that. But you told that. the Chancellor and, and you took I, action. I certainly rang the Chancellor yeah. and I certainly told him exactly what was being said on the doorstep. How, how did this conversation way. go? Did he say, Tamsin, what a, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to change this. What? Uh, um, I wouldn't say those were his words, <laughs> to oh. be honest with you. Uh, do you when, when he got to cabinet, Jeff Hoon, did Alistair Darling say, I've had the conversation with that Tamsin Dunwoody. This 10p tax change is a bit of a mistake. I'm going to change it, chaps. There's certainly no doubt that Tamsin Dunwoody put her case pretty forcefully to the Chancellor, and I would well, expect that. Would, so. you, would you agree with her summary of events here, that she spoke to the Chancellor and... He took action as a consequence. I think it's fair to say that the Chancellor was pretty well aware of the concern about 10p, but there's no doubt that Tamsin argues her case on behalf of the people of Crewe and Nantwich extraordinarily well. This um, sum adds up if you divide the total amount of money by the number of voters here at approximately £385,000 per voter in this constituency. It's good value? Extremely good value, because what we are doing <laughs> is ensuring that right across the country, those who were affected by the 10p tax change will be compensated. The government made that absolutely clear, the Chancellor's made it clear, and the Prime Minister has made it okay, clear. OK, back there. The blue show. reality is that there's a, a large number of people who are not going to be compensated as a result of the tax changes. And uh, it's those in most needs that need compensation. Well, can, can I make it clear no. that we have been able to take this decision on raising personal allowances to deal with the overwhelming majority of affected Well, it doesn't people. affect a million people. No, but the Chancellor well, equally made it clear. No, the Chancellor equally made it clear that at the pre-budget report, he will deal with the other categories, those people who are still not compensated by the measures that he's taken so far. They're people who are in a slightly different position, they don't benefit from the personal allowances, but we are determined to ensure that no one will lose out as a result of this change. I still think it's a kick in the teeth for the lowest earning people in this country. Absolutely. It's an absolute kick in the teeth. And I was a staunch Labour supporter and I really feel at the moment I cannot vote for Labour. I feel disenfranchised because I think once you took the social out of Labour and socialism, you, you, you became new Tory. And as far as I'm concerned, there's very little difference between you and your colleague on that front row, either Tory or Labour. Your policies don't... There's not enough space between your policies. OK, the chap next to you. And, and really, I think it's very worrying that nobody in the Treasury or the Prime Minister's office saw the potential shambles of this decision that was made a year, nearly a year ago on this 10p tax ban that was allowed to carry on until suddenly, after it, was, after it came in in April, well, you know, it's, 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 it's very worrying. That... But, but, but please bear in mind that at the same time, we also lowered the basic rate of tax uh, by two pence, so from 22 to 20, affecting the great majority but, but of the, the country. But it's so the trust that people actually now make are... A people very worried about the decision you're change. making because the we can't trust you anymore. No, the poorest didn't have to pay for it. Yes, what they is did. In... No, no, well, they did, no, that's why you had to change policy, No, no, Jeff. no, it isn't why we had to change policy. We changed policy because we recognised that certain sections of the community were affected. It wasn't actually, Michael, the poorest, because they were benefiting from the uh, tax changes that we made so in Tamsin, the previous Tamsin budget. Was wrong, but the basic, no, was wrong no, no Tamsin was absolutely <laughs> right to make her point on behalf of the people Look. of this constituency and indeed of the country. Okay. That is why we've changed the policy, but can I make it absolutely okay. clear? We will go on so ensuring... Didn't change it to help we will go so on I'll ask your good questions around here, that. Michael. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, one of them is this piece of propaganda <laughs> issued by your candidate. Labour's Grand Theft Auto, how Gordon Brown is making life a misery for car drivers, mm. goes on about speed cameras and it goes on about the cost of petrol and car tax and so on. Um, what happened to Vote Blue, Go Green? 
Well, one of the changes that I think the Chancellor has made to vehicle excise duty actually penalises middle-of-the-range cars more than it penalises the real gas-guzzling cars. So one of the points that I think uh, was very effectively made by George Osborne, and I think Mike Natras from UK has made this argument as well. But you don't well. this is on about the price of fuel. I mean, by no. what factor would you cut the levy on fuel? Well, we're going to see, I think, uh, uh, Gordon Brown and Alistair Darling bring forward proposals this autumn. But well, last week. Alistair Darling. What will you do, Michael? Alistair what will you do, Michael? Well, we've been... You've got a mask in suggest- you. Yes. Come on. What will you do? You want to cut... Ca- yeah, sorry. You want to cut the cost of fuel, according to this. By what proportion? It raises, what, about £25 mm. billion or something, doesn't it? Tax well, the ball, look, the ball's in Alistair Darling's court. We're going to find out ah. what he's going to say. One of the things, so you don't though... don't have a policy. Yeah, we, we, well, we're asking okay, so the questions. I'm asking you. I'm not asking the you to tell me what he, he think he might do. <laughs> well, we're, we're going to wait to see what Gordon but, Brown and Alistair but, Darling do at the pre-budget report. But, and one of the I points we've what made... What should he do? What should he do? Well, he should do something to help hard-pressed motorists. Um, do, you know, do you know how, how? much it costs? How? To, do you know how much it costs to fill a family car, Jeff? Do you know what? Do you know what a litre of petrol costs? I have three children. It costs Michael, me about did, did you? Were you yes. aware and that? You and do you know how much it's increased in the last few months? That, <laughs> and do you believe that drivers should be helped? Okay. And if so, I believe all of those things, so, Michael. But good. what I want to know is what is your party's policy on this important issue that you've highlighted well, me, in that leaflet? Tell me. Tell me what Alistair Darling's going to do to help drivers. And I'll tell you whether or not I think it's good enough. Questions. Neither of you. I'll tell you what Alistair Darling does. Alistair Darling has already frozen the. Duty Vince Cable, you presumably are delighted to see the cost of motoring so high. It's not, green. A, not at all, but we're not offering to cut taxes no. that we don't have revenue to pay for. I mean, last week in Parliament, the Conservatives introduced a motion uh, to t- stall the increase in vehicle excise duty. It was completely contrary to their supposedly mm. green credential without indicating how this money was going to be raised. And it goes back to the kind of argument we had about the 10p rate. I mean, we okay. spotted that I immediately. What, but, we had an alternative but, funded by people who were relatively well off, and we voted against it, whereas these guys, the Conservatives, didn't there is a, spot it, didn't vote against there it. There is a big well, problem here. This is a really... And this, did vote against this it. Is a, this is a live issue. Just, to, just have a yeah. show of hands. How many people think that the rate of duty on fuel should be cut? <laughs> well, I'd say it's almost everyone. No, you haven't put your hand up, sir, but, uh, and okay. there's a woman behind you who hasn't, but by and large, everyone else. See, that's, that's what you're up against. Mm. Um, let's look now at... Uh, yes, you, know, you wanted to come in, didn't you? Go on. I was going to say this is the two Tweedledums and Libdum just fighting over nothing because they've given all their power away anyway to Brussels. Ah, uh, you are... My you are you, UKIP. You UKIP, yes, yeah. OK. Right, so we know what you, where you're coming from. So, exactly. Uh, and uh, but while we're at it, we might as well have you as well. But as an English Democrat, you presumably... What's your take on this? Our take is generally, I've been listening to the gentleman speak for the last few minutes and the, the sort of squabbles, but they haven't really referred to the working people too well. You know, the English working people are getting a raw deal, <coughs> specifically in the area of um, devolution. Prescription charges, for example, is quite an expensive part. The local people in Crewe and Nantwich are paying £7.10p per, per item. <coughs> and then just a few miles to the west here in Wales, um, the prescriptions are free. So, you know, the prescription... You moved to Wales. Well, you know, the situation with Audlem in the south of Cheshire, they uh, had a spoof on April the 1st <laughs> suggesting that very thing. <clears throat> and then when the people really looked at it, they thought it wasn't such a stupid idea. We're going to move on to something else now, because as it happens, Newsnight's uh, taken quite an interesting crew for some time. A couple of years ago, Tim Hewell came here and found, despite all the government assurances to the contrary, there were thousands of Polish migrants living and working here. They made up about 6% of the population, filling many part-time jobs. Tim's come back to find out how the local community feel about it now and what the implications of tougher economic times might be. Their economy's on the way up. Ours is on the way down, but they're still coming here. Twice a day you'll find Poles gathering in the middle of crew, mostly fairly new arrivals, waiting to be bussed off to a shift in the food processing plants around the town. Even with prices rising here and the value of the pound falling against the Polish lotti, this is a profitable place to spend a year or two. The jobs aren't better, they're just better paid and that's all. Well, people here aren't that wonderful, but the work conditions are good. In particular, earnings are better. Even now, no-one knows how many Poles are in crew. 
but it's still at least as many, if not considerably more, than the 3,000 who'd arrived by early 2006, 6% 6 of the town's population. Nearly two and a half years ago, in this fairly ordinary town, Newsnight discovered that something extraordinary had happened. People had started to hear a foreign language, one most didn't even recognise, spoken all around them. Our report helped spark a national debate on the scale of a migration that the government had completely failed to predict. The Koloszynskis, from the rural west of Poland, were among the families that no one expected to come, despite the eastward expansion of the European Union. Now they're putting down roots here. Adam, nice to see you again. Very nice to see you. And you've got, and you've got a new one. They've had another child, crew born, and they've bought a house. Adam, with a degree in maths and computing, isn't stretched by his job in a pizza plant. But after living in six cramped, rented places, his family now have all the space they need to play or hide. It's better, it's quiet. Better for family. <laughs> because don't, don't must move, have permanent house. But does that mean you're going to live here permanently? Uh, yes, probably yes. <laughs> and does it mean, for example, that you, do you get a British passport? Maybe later, if, I, if we can. More Polish families means more pressure on local services. There were 21 other Polish children at Ever and Agnieszka's school then. Now there are 100, though the schools have no direct state money to help it with language support. But more families also means an easing of the tensions that arose when new arrivals were almost all young and occasionally rowdy single workers. So though migration is certainly an election issue, okay. it's not the decisive one. It's eased the situation in a good many respects, but again, I think the numbers have just uh, been too numerous really to take in all at once, as it were. So does that affect how you vote? Uh, no, not necessarily so, no. I've met professional people who are doing low-paid jobs because they've come here to get the work. So, you know, you can't, you, you've got to admire that, I think. I know everybody's got to have uh, a right to come in the country, but since they've been in, it's, it's cutting our, our, our blokes out of work, really, isn't it? Two and a half years ago, we met the Roberts family. They complained the house next door was crammed with noisy Polish migrants. Now, Brian, a manager with a building firm, says his main fear is for jobs. It won't be much longer before this British will not be able to find the jobs. The last few months, men have been getting laid off in the house building industry. A lad who's, um, you know, digging trenches on the site, if he, hasn't, if he can't dig trenches on the site, he'll go into a packaging company, won't he? But the poles are there. So is he going to get the job? I don't think he will. At Advanced Personnel, the recruitment agency responsible for much of the original influx of Poles, they say there's now more turnaround of migrants, with new arrivals coming for a shorter time as conditions back home improve. But they also say some local people are now going for the same temporary jobs that no one from here wanted two years ago. Since maybe midsummer last year, we've seen a lot of the skilled Polish staff have gone back home for more money and to return to, you know, decent positions over there. And obviously this year we've seen a slight rise in terms of the number of UK applicants coming through the door looking for work. And what are they saying? Um, they're just saying that they've been laid off and that obviously they need work and they need to be, you know, placed straight away to pay the bills that they've got. What's the Marquisa, please, sir? Advanced personnel employees finishing their shifts only have to cross the road to reach Crewe's new stronghold of east-west understanding, the old Duke of Bridgewater, now under Polish management. Devotees of Lech Lager and fans of local bitter sup happily side by side, but that harmony may be hard to maintain if the economy dips much further. Jeff Hoon, you accept that on your watch, your administration, the complexion of places like Crewe has changed hugely. It has certainly changed, but I thought the example of the family that uh, Tim had been to see two years ago was a good example of what is happening. Here's a family, clearly a man in work, 
paying tax, paying national insurance, contributing both to the society here as well as to the country. Bear in mind that we have more people in work today in this country than ever before in our history. Some of them are from Poland, but we have a thriving, strong economy as far as those people are concerned. Are you all as uh, relaxed about this as, uh, as Jeff Hoon is? Yeah? No. I can't tell whether, whether you're saying yes or no. No, no, you're not saying it. Yes, Ms. No, Lady because here. of the education of the children. If you've got a class of 30 and you've got a lot of children who can't speak English, the teacher must be giving her time to some of those children. So what happens to the English-speaking children? But actually, can I tell you, my wife teaches Polish children in Derby, where there's always been a big Polish population from the days of the Second World War. It's now bigger, and I accept it's changed. But actually, the kinds of people who are coming here from Poland very often already have some English, and they, their children actually do learn English very, very quickly. Tamsin Dunwoody, I'm slightly concerned about this, that, given what you've just heard Jeff Hoon say, that you play this in your election literature about how you will campaign for a sensible pr approach to immigration that takes account of genuine concerns and attacking the Tories because they don't support, as you put it, identity cards for foreigners. They don't support identity cards for anyone. Mm. I mean, this is just pathetic kind of dog whistle stuff, isn't it? No, it isn't. I mean, there are genuine well, concerns that we have to uh, be aware of and, well, and Jeff's highlighted some of those. It's uh, you're as relaxed schools... as he is about it, are you? I, I'm certainly relaxed about um, making sure that people that come into Britain are here, feeding into the economy, bringing in skills. But I'm also very concerned that we well, why have make you got it sure. Why number three on your action plan? Because it is a genuine concern to people in Crewe and Nantwich, and I'm also concerned that the, the Polish here are not exploited by unscrupulous workers. I'm concerned that health yeah. services and schools are there to support the children of both local children and Polish workers, and that can be an additional strain. You're saying no in the front row. I'm I can saying hear you. no because all of this has been given away. Obviously, there are no borders anymore to the EU, so these people can come in quite freely. And this argument should be about space, not race. There isn't the facilities here. We need more services to serve a bigger population. Schools, hospitals, roads, and all of the other services okay. are under stress. There's a lady back there in the blue you were speaking earlier. Today, that two million people have emigrated from this country. Mm -hmm. So we need to replace the workers who are leaving this country. So you're with quite immigrants. relaxed about it, are you? My only concern is that the, the immigrants are contributing towards the economy yeah. and it's going to central government, and central government are not reinvesting enough in local services and local authorities to manage the needs of local services. And that's, that's a concern. But people come in, I welcome diversity. And I think, you know, we should be investing in diversity. Very quick couple of other responses from the audience, please. Yes, you, sir. C could I ask the three people in the front why they think these two million people are leaving the country? Oh, well, crikey, that's quite a comp. That's a very long <laughs> wow. shopping list. Here's another chat with your hand up in your background. Yeah, go on. Crew is at its best when it reaches out to people. We've had Polish immigrants before, they've settled in. But we not have in actually, these numbers. We have, attracted, we have attracted industry because of the Polish people that have come in here. I think the, your audience here said it quite clearly, that um, crew has been enriched by Polish people. I know that there can be problems. There, there's always going to be problems. But sometimes right. if you go to any of our churches, what you'll see is the United Nations at prayer. And okay. I think that's a great thing to All say. right, I want to ask these guys finally to give us one uh, quick answer to this question. If Gordon Brown, if Labour loses this by-election, Gordon Brown can't survive, can he, Jeff? Of course he can. We've had by-elections before. It's a well-known phenomena that in mid-term governments do get a kicking. And All if right. We get, what do you think, Vince happens, Well, he's already damaged and he'll be damaged further. And one of the reasons is that the, the basic issues in which this particular by-election have been fought have been big national concern. It's been about the 10p tax rate. It's been about post office closures. And these are things for which he, as the Prime Minister, has direct responsibility. So there is a direct damage to him. He won't necessarily go the mm. following day. Now, what about your own leader? Aaron Letters had a very good 
record. I mean, he's been mm. consistently written down, talked down by the commentators, but we were written off in those local election campaigns a few weeks ago. We overtook Labour in the popular vote, and he was our leader, and he's done it very effectively. But if you're not challenging the Tories, or the, sorry, the challenging the government in areas like this... Well, we are challenging the government, and we, we will do a great deal better than you're giving us credit for. I can All right, well, we'll, we'll see you on Thursday, yeah, and I'll be see. happy to eat my words, yeah, then, if you're, if you're right. Michael Gove, presumably you desperately want Gordon Brown to survive, don't you? What I want Gordon Brown to do is to learn the lesson of this campaign, and there are two things he needs to learn. The first is that you cannot have tax changes that punish the poor for electoral reasons, and the second thing is you will not profit by running what you've accurately described, Jeremy, as a dog-whistle campaign that appeals to prejudice. We've had a very temperate debate here tonight, which has demonstrated that Crewe is a generous-hearted place, and it represents... And people to my have mind, legitimate concerns, Michael. Yeah, no, no, Jeremy, of course they have legitimate concerns, but everything that we've heard from the audience tonight reinforces the fact that people are open-minded and generous. Yeah. The Labour campaign has pandered to people's worst instincts, and I hope that the result will send a message to Gordon Brown and to the Labour government that but, this campaign has not been worthy of progressive politics. But uh, what do you think about that uh, interpretation of the campaign you so roundly defended earlier? Well, I simply don't accept it. I've been with Tamsin Dunwoody in different parts of Crewe and Nantwich. I've seen the way she's related well, to local people. I've seen the Harry issues Harman she's taken up. seems to accept it was all pretty negative. I don't think she did. I think what's important what? is that we focus on what is important to the people of this constituency. I think Tamsin Dunwoody is best placed to fight for the people of Crewe and Nantwich. All right, chaps, well, we'll see what happens uh, when the uh, good people of Crewe and Nantwich go to the polls. Um, 48 hours, we'll know whether Crewe and Nantwich will join the annals of famous by-election upsets or be just another full start in a Conservative recovery. Good night now from Crewe and Nantwich. Thank you, Jeremy. MPs at Westminster are voting tonight on whether to change the law on abortion for the first time in 18 years. They've been considering a cut in the time limit when abortions can take place from the current 24 weeks. The vote, which is according to conscience rather than party, comes as part of the debate over the government's human fertilisation and embryology bill. Already attempts to underline the role of a father before IVF treatment have been defeated. For the latest, we can join Ian Watson at Westminster. Ian, they've been voting. What's been happening? Well, they're still voting, actually. It's a relatively quiet um, central lobby here in the House of Commons. MPs not forcing their way onto television for once because they're still in the division lobbies. They're voting to try and reduce uh, the abortion limit from 24 weeks currently to 22 weeks. But we've had a whole range of results so far on different options for reducing the abortion time limit. For example, uh, the... Uh, 20-week limit, which David Cameron, the Conservative leader, favours. We had the vote on that just 15 minutes ago, and the government won that by 142 votes, a massive majority for the government. So, frankly, I would be surprised if in the next few minutes uh, MPs vote to reduce the uh, time limit to 22 weeks. I suspect they'll vote for the status quo, the option which Gordon Brown himself favours. And this, of course, has been a free vote, so perhaps there's a lesson for the Prime Minister here. If you actually want to win something, then don't try and control it. A free vote, so an issue of conscience, but nevertheless, obviously, very strong feelings on both sides of the debate. How would you characterise the tone of the argument? Well, the debates ranged, I think, from being extremely sober and considered to downright gory. The Conservative MP Edward Lee opened the debate. He wanted to see a reduction to 12 weeks, which was pretty heavily defeated. And he said, and there was audible gasps from his fellow MPs when he said this, but he said, the least safe place in Britain for a child is inside her mother's womb. Uh, we then had uh, Nadine Doris, the uh, Conservative MP, who wants to reduce the limit to 20 weeks, given those rather graphic descriptions of um, uh, aborted fetuses. And uh, we also had on the other side, Christine McCaffrey to the Labour MP who campaigns for the current limit to stay in place. She raised the spectre, if that's the right phrase, of um, a return to backstreet abortions. She said any reduction in the limit from 24 weeks would lead to an increase in illegal abortions, which would put women's lives at risk. So I think free of the, the party whips and free of the spin, if you like, we've really been hearing what MPs actually think in this issue and haven't been mincing their words. Now, one thing that they've also spoken about, of course, is the amendment put forward by Ian Duncan Smith, stressing the role of a father, the importance of a father before couples are considered for IVF treatment. In the end, that got defeated. 
that was also defeated pretty decisively as well uh, and by a bigger margin than most people thought. Uh, he wanted to make sure that IVF clinics, when they're considering uh, treatment, uh, would uh, take into consideration the need for both a mother and a father. Now, that was defeated and we have the government's position again, which is uh, simply to call uh, for uh, effectively for responsible parenting. They're saying this won't discriminate against lesbian couples or against single women. And Ian Duncan Smith's position would have done, although perhaps uh, one of the more amusing parts of the debate was when the Islington South MP, Emily Thornby, accused Dean Duncan Smith of being old-fashioned and rising his defence. The, the grand old man of the Commons, Sir Patrick Cormack, stood up and said, I don't know what's common sense in Islington, but in Staffordshire it's common sense to have both a mother and a father. <laughs> Ian Watson from Westminster, thanks very much indeed. The Chinese government says that more than 40,000 people are now known to have died as a result of the earthquake in Sichuan province. More than 30,000 others are still missing. The Independent Police Complaints Commission has begun an investigation into how 16-year-old Hayley Adamson was killed by a police car last night in Newcastle. During a dispute that followed the crash, officers fired a taser gun and one man was arrested. Doctors in America say the Massachusetts Senator Edward Kennedy has a brain tumour. Senator Kennedy is a second longest serving member of the Senate and the brother of the late President John F. Kennedy. He was admitted to hospital after suffering a seizure on Saturday. Members of the Police Federation in England and Wales have voted overwhelmingly in favour of lobbying for the right to strike. They were balloted after an agreed 2.5% pay rise wasn't backdated by the Home Secretary Jackie Smith. And the markets, the FTSE 100 index was down significantly as oil prices hit a record high. In New York, the Dow Jones closed down too. Against the euro, the pound was up. Against the dollar, the pound was also up. And uh, now we can look at the front page of the papers, which we've got here. The Daily Mail, the story that we had earlier, fathers not required. Uh, MPs decide IVF babies have no need for male role models. And The Guardian has the same story, major change to IVF law as need for father is removed. Different story on the Financial Times. Bank bonuses, apparently the uh, watchdog, the Financial Services Authority, is going to look at them. Picture of football boots on the Independent, I wonder why. That, of course, is what's going to be happening in Moscow tomorrow. The Times back to uh, the story, women win the right to children without fathers. And The Telegraph, families with two mothers win legal status. Uh, the son, meanwhile, boot him out of tune. That's uh, Joey Barton, who got uh, imprisoned for attacks. That is all from Newsnight tonight from our team here in the studio and also in crew. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.